So we need to proceed to the uh, last presentation. Rodrigo, since I was uh, young, my favorite journal uh, has been uh, JAMA. And anytime there is an RCT uh, on colonoscopy in JAMA, it comes from uh, Samir Gupta. So it doesn't need uh, any presentation. He is now the primary author and main responsible of the American uh, Multi Task Force Guide on Post Polypatrian Surveillance. Uh, and uh, you will see he did a great job in comparing uh, with uh, our uh, European guideline, Rodrigo. Samir, thanks, uh, of course, uh, to join. Thanks, Cesar. That was a very generous introduction. Uh, I'm going to be comparing the multi society task force uh, guidelines from the US and the latest European Society of GI endoscopy guidelines. So we'll identify key differences between these two guidelines and discuss the points of emphasis in each of the guidelines, which may have led to the differences observed. Here are the recommendations for conventional adenomas. The MSTF recommended a seven to 10 year follow-up for those with one to two small adenomas and a three to five year follow-up for those with three to four small adenomas whereas the ESGE recommended a return to screening for these groups. For people with villus or tubular villus adenomas, MSTF recommended three years, whereas ESGE recommended a return to screening if no other surveillance criteria were met. Here are the recommendations for serrated polyps where you see more differences. The MSTF for people with one to two small serrated polyps recommended five to 10 year follow-up and a three to five year follow-up for those with three to four histologically defined sessile serrated polyps. Whereas the ESGE recommended a return to screening for this group if they did not have other adenomas. For people with five to 10, year, five to 10 sessile serrated polyps, MSTF recommended three years and the ESGE I don't think had a recommendation I can be corrected. Uh, for large hyperplastic polyps, the MSTF allowed for a three to five year follow up, whereas the ESGE offered a firm three year recommendation. So let's take a look at some of the data that were available to the task force and, and try and figure out the points of emphasis that led to differences. And I'll focus on the low risk adenoma and serrated polyp data. So for low risk adenomas, we're very fortunate now to have at least four large longitudinal studies which compared colon cancer incidence and mortality for people with low risk adenoma versus normal lower endoscopy. And what you see here in these cumulative uh, incidence curves and in the data here is strikingly similar with respect to a cumulative incidence of colon cancer in the normal group ranging from 0.24 to 1.4% and in the low risk adenoma group ranging from 0.3 to 1.2%. For mortality, the range uh, was 0.07% to 1.1% for normal and 0.03 to 0.14% for low risk adenoma. And in none of the comparisons was there any statistically significant difference in the risk for incident or fatal cancer. Although I will say and point out that the confidence intervals were wide and there was some discordance with respect to mortality with respect to the point estimates. So in terms of point, uh, points of emphasis, the ESGE appeared to emphasize the lower colon cancer incidence and mortality observed compared with the general population for the low risk adenoma group, a similar colon cancer incidence compared with normal colonoscopy, and an interpretation that the studies available showed that the benefit of surveillance for this group has been excluded. The MSTF uh, did put some emphasis about the uncertainty regarding the role of surveillance in the outcomes that were observed. For example, in three of the studies, the cumulative colonoscopy exposure in the no adenoma group ranged from 20 to 70%, and in the one to two adenoma group ranged from nearly 60 to 78% raising the possibility that surveillance might have had a role in normalizing the difference in outcomes 
between the low risk adenoma and no adenoma group. Another point of emphasis was concerns about patient risk perception, as well as a practical issue around practice disruption, which we can discuss. In terms of the risk for colon cancer associated with serrated polyps versus normal lower endoscopy, uh, there are two studies that we can draw from. And by full disclosure, this second study by Dan Lee and colleagues from Kaiser, California, it was not available to either task force when they made their recommendations. The HE study was a large cohort study um, and basically looked at the risk for incident cancer among people with small serrated polyps and large serrated polyps. In the small serrated polyp group, they found no difference compared to those who had normal colonoscopy. In the Lee study, they found a 2.6 fold increased risk. I should point out that in the HE study, the small serrated polyp group included people with distal hyperplastic polyps, which we've understood for a long time, uh, do not appear to confer increased risk for colon cancer. Both studies were consistent in finding a increased risk for incident cancer among people who had a baseline large serrated polyp. And you can see the cumulative incidence curves here most notably no difference here between small serrated and no polyp group in the HE study, but a stratification based on whether the dist there were distal serrated polyps with no difference compared to no polyp and higher risk for the small proximal and large proximal group. So in terms of points of emphasis, the ESGE seemed to emphasize the lack of evidence for importance of serrated lesions less than one centimeter uh, the MSTF, we had a suspicion that small proximal serrated polyps may confer colon cancer risk. We also put emphasis on the increased risk for large serrated polyps among people with any size serrated polyp. For example, in this cohort study by Joey Anderson and colleagues, nearly 10% of people with any size serrated polyp, sessile serrated polyp at baseline, developed a large serrated polyp on follow-up. And if we believe that these are a high risk lesion for development into colon cancer, then these become a screening, a surveillance target. We also recognize the sparsity of data that was available and balance that with what we thought was a need to provide guidance to, in order to avoid chaos at the time of colonoscopy. So in summary, the MSTF and ESG recommendations do share many similarities. Uh, we both downgraded uh, the recommendations for people with one to four small adenomas. And in my opinion, the differences are mainly attributable to our reaction to the lack of data and our approach to weighing the strengths and weaknesses of the available studies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samir. Very nice uh, update of the results of both guidelines. Uh, you, you have uh, highlighted very nicely the differences between, between uh, guidelines. Do you think that guidelines uh, should be different, differentially oriented depending on the, on the audience? The audience for uh, the EU, the European guidelines is mainly fit-based uh, screening audience. And the audience from the EU's guideline is mainly a colonoscopy-based uh, audience. So do, do you think that is another point for the difference, the, the being more conservative for the EU and more radical for the European? It, yeah, I mean, the penetrance, as you know, of colonoscopy in general practice in the US is so um, pervasive. Um, people have already, who've had polyps have already been very conditioned to expect frequent colonoscopy. So, in a way, we are more starting from a place of being very aggressive and trying to dial things back. And so I think that that does uh, create some unique challenges and, and, and certainly that accounts for some of the differences. You, we start with the assumption, the general assumption that surveillance is needed. And I think, I suspect that on the European side, you start with the assumption that surveillance is not needed and you want to prove that it is. And, and I, I think that's valid, but uh, I, I think th that may explain the differences. That's, that's true, that's true. I, th I think there is a, a, a different point of view between Europe and, and the US for, for the need and the, the role of surveillance. There is another question from the audience. 
what's your opinion about the stopping age for polyp surveillance from Anne-Marie van Berko? Uh, I think it needs to be carefully studied. The, the patients who I feel the worst about scoping are my 75 and 80 year old patients who are coming for surveillance of your know, two, three uh, adenomas. Uh, I, I think certainly if there's not a life expectancy of at least five years, that we shouldn't entertain it. And I think we should be really, really careful in people who are on anticoagulant medications. I mean, even if we find some polyps, their bleeding risk is significant. And um, I'm just not convinced that we're, we're, we're doing those patients a service by, by doing the surveillance, but I, I do think we need more data. Okay, Samir, thank you.